Some Criticisms of Marxism, Part 3. Marxism's concept of economic or historic progress is extremely Eurocentric. As was demonstrated in the previous video, a key aspect of Marxist theory is the idea of progress. The previous video demonstrated the flaws in this conception of historical progress, let alone such progress being inevitable. However, within this premise of Marxism lies an often overlooked idea that further undermines Marxism as an adequate explanatory framework. Marxism's conception of progress and its subsequent analysis is inherently Eurocentric. As was discussed in the previous video, Marxist analysis of social political change was dependent upon class conflict leading to progress. Furthermore, these stages of class conflict are dialectical and must progress through a certain order. Slaves and masters must come into conflict. Plebeians and patricians must come into conflict. Each successive conflict leads to a new and more advanced form of economic production. Slavery to feudalism, feudalism to capitalism, capitalism to socialism, socialism to communism. On the surface, this seems like a plausible explanation, especially if one puts aside the criticisms found in the previous video. However, a key problem with this analysis is that it almost exclusively looks to his the history of Europe to draw its data. In and of itself, this may not be a problem. However, Marxism is not merely claiming to explain the progress of European society. Rather, Marxism seeks to describe the progress of all human societies. In this regard, Marxism's over-reliance on European examples is hardly useful for the purposes of making generalizations about human behavior. Furthermore, such an over-reliance has a tendency to make European culture and society seem superior to other cultures and societies. For one thing, the inevitable progress of human economies and societies rarely, if ever, followed the course that Marx laid out. In particular, this can be seen in the context of feudalism. Far from being, being inevitable or universal, feudalism was an extremely rare phenomenon in world history. The feudal structure as observed by Marx was only ever present in two societies, Europe and Japan. The social and governmental structures of India, China, the Arab empires, the Mongol empires, or any other advanced civilization hardly, if ever, resembled feudalism. Indeed, when faced with this reality, Marxists try to shoehorn these structures into the term semi-feudal, a term which largely derives from British colonialism in India. Most human societies have not been structured in a feudalistic framework. It is a very particular phenomenon that is observed only in a few cases in history. Edwin O. Reischauer observes this, the unique nature of feudalism when comparing Japanese and European feudalism. Reischauer writes, quote, The resemblance of Japanese feudalism to that of Western Europe is remarkable. In both cases, feudalism may have resulted from a special blending of concepts of central imperial rule with native traditions of tribal organization and personalized bond, bonds of loyalty. Apparently, this exact blend is an unusual one in world history because Japan affords the only close and fully developed parallel to Western feudalism, unquote. Feudalism is not a universal stage of inevitable human progress. To state otherwise, is to take an extremely Eurocentric view of human history and social change. Further, according to Marxism, each successive stage of social development was necessarily more productive than the previous stage. This contention is undermined when one looks at historical examples outside of the context of Europe. China, for instance, had been the engine of the global economy for centuries. While Europe was supposedly more advanced than the semi-feudal Chinese, the Chinese outstripped Europe in manufacturing, military power, technology, luxury goods, and overall wealth. Similarly, the Muslim Arab empires 
were more advanced in mathematics, philosophy, and science. All of this was occurring at the same time when Europe was largely an economic and political backwater, and arguably had been so since the fall of the Roman Empire. Famously, the Europeans possessed very little that the Chinese and the Indians wanted to trade for directly. When the Europeans began entering the Indian Ocean trade network in the 16th century and, quote, sought trading rights, the Mughal emperors saw no threat in granting them, unquote. Despite these facts, Marx persists in stating that Europe was necessarily more socially advanced. Marx referred to Egypt and India as having a crude form of the division of labor, despite the apparent superiority of these civilizations over Europe. Elsewhere, in Marx's essay on imperialism in India, Marx refers to Indian communities as being, quote, semi-barbarian, semi-civilized communities, unquote. Much, much ink has been used to try to explain why it was that Europe grew to global prominence in the 18th and 19th centuries and why the Western world persists to be dominant in the 20th and 21st centuries. To date, there is no definitive answer. Some have made the argument that such dominance is largely due to accidents of geography. This is largely the central thrust of Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. The rapid industrial growth of Europe is largely due to plentiful iron and coal deposits that other regions did not possess. Other arguments have been put forward that it was not until the discovery and exploitation of the Americas that Europeans became prominent players on the global stage. Utilizing gold and silver extracted from South American mines, the Spanish finally had something that the Chinese were willing to trade for. Marx himself acknowledges that Europe really only came into global prominence following the discovery of America. Other arguments put an emphasis on European ideals of individualism and entrepreneurship that sprang out of Christianity, the Enlightenment, and the Scientific Revolution. This would further undermine Marx's contentions because the Marxists declared that the modes of production shape one's philosophy and modes of thinking stating that these ideas shaped the mode of production, undermine this Marxist notion. Regardless of the reasons for the European development of industrial capitalism and its subsequent rise to dominate the world, it certainly was not the result of inevitable social progress, nor is it a universal law of human relations. Marx is not only engaging in Eurocentric economic and historical analysis that is flawed, he's also doing so in such a way that propagates Orientalist and racist myths that were ultimately used to justify European imperialism. When discussing the history of India before the British arrived, Marx speaks of, quote, Asiatic despotism, unquote, and makes assertions about how quote, all Asiatic governments, unquote, behave. Not only does he discuss how all Asiatic governments behave, but also how they have done so from, quote, t immemorial times, unquote. While Marx engages in a harsh criticism of British imperialism in India, nevertheless, he got, does so by repeating Orientalist myths and ultimately justifies British colonialism. While Marx expresses sympathy for the plight of the Indian people underneath the heel of British imperialism, he nevertheless expresses contempt for Indian society and culture. Marx writes, quote, we must not forget that these idyllic village communities, inoffensive though they may appear, had always been the solid foundation of Oriental despotism, that the restrained human mind within the smallest possible compass, making it the unresisting tool of superstition, enslaving it beneath traditional rules, depriving it of all grandeur and historical energies. We must not forget the barbarian egotism which had quietly witnessed the ruin of empires." Unquote. Connected to this, though Marx condemns Britain for its treatment of the Indians, and how Britain, quote, 
was actuated only by the vilest interests, unquote. Marx nevertheless justifies in British imperialism in a number of ways. For one, Marx asserts, asserts that India would have been inevitably conquered by some other foreign power. As such, Britain's conquest was the lesser evil. Marx writes, quote, The question, therefore, is not whether the English had a right to conquer India, but whether we are to prefer India conquered by the Turk, by the Persian, by the Russian, to India conquered by the Briton, unquote. Another way that Marx justifies British imperialism is that Indian culture, along with all other Oriental cultures, were inevitably meant to be destroyed. The fundamental changes upon India wrought by the British were necessary steps towards historical progress. Marx asks, asks a series of rhetorical questions, the answers to which, to Marx, are obvious. Quote, the question is, can mankind fulfill its destiny without a fundamental revolution in the social state of Asia? If not, whatever may have been the crimes of England, she was the unconscious tool of history in bringing about that revolution, unquote. Later, in the same essay, Marx reasserts this same point. Marx writes, quote, England has to fulfill a double mission in India, one destructive, the other regenerating, the annihilation of old Asiatic society and the laying of the material foundations of Western society in Asia, unquote. Not only is Marx making very broad, contentious, and racist assertions about Indians, in many ways he is making broad generalizations about other non-European groups. When discussing India's culture, society, and government, Marx states that the Indians were behaving, quote, like all Oriental peoples, unquote. This is a generalization that sweeps up into it assertions about Arabs, Punjabs, Thais, Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Mongolians, Manchurians, Kazakhs, among many other groups. Whole swaths of distinct cultures with distinct histories and heritages are generalized in this one simple statement. In this regard, Marx is parroting various assertions from Orientalist scholars throughout the 19th century, myths that ultimately justified European imperialism. These assertions are inherently based upon overbroad generalizations. Historian Edward Said observes in his book, Orientalism, quote, we are immediately brought back to the realization that Orientalists, like many other early 19th century thinkers, conceive of humanity either in large collective terms or in abstract generalities. Orientalists are neither interested in nor capable of discussing individuals." Unquote. In an interesting irony, Although the Marxists and communists envisaged themselves as consistently anti-imperialists, they ultimately assert their own version of the white man's burden. In a letter to Karl Kautsky in 1882, Engels envisioned the independence of colonial peoples following the proletarian revolution. He writes, quote, The countries inhabited by a native population, which are simply subjugated, India, Algeria, the Dutch, Portuguese, and Spanish possessions must be taken over for the time being by the proletariat and led as rapidly as possible towards independence, unquote. However, even though these places gain their independence, they will not be permitted to keep their cultures and heritages. These artifacts will invariably be stripped from them by the processes of history, so-called. In the same letter, Engels writes, quote, Once Europe is reorganized in North America, that will furnish such a colossal power that will make an example to the semi-civilized countries, will of themselves follow in their wake, unquote. It is the duty of the international proletariat to spread the progress of 19th century European society around the world. Regardless of Marx's antipathy 
to imperialism, his lines of argument and his conception of historical progress invariably justify this imperialism. Marx repeats Orientalist myths and ultimately props up the notion that European culture was superior to the cultures they conquered. He does so in order to further prove his economic and social theories and to further the cause of the communist revolution and the inevitable utopia at the end of history. Edward Said observes, quote, in part, of course, Marx was concerned with vindicating his own theses on socioeconomic revolution, unquote. In large part, this is due to Marx's analytical methodology, looking exclusively at class conflict as the driver of historical progress, and of course, looking at people as large groups of people and not individuals. Edward Said further observes, quote, as human material, the Orient is less important than as an element in a romantic redemptive project. Marx's economic analyses are perfectly fitted thus to a standard Orientalist undertaking, even though Marx's humanity, his sympathy for the misery of people are clearly engaged. Yet in the end, it is the romantic Orientalist vision that wins out." Unquote. This is another aspect wherein Marxist analysis is fundamentally flawed. Marx's conception of historical progress is inherently Eurocentric and as such is of limited use, not only in the analysis of the past events, but also in making predictions of future conditions. Further, this Eurocentrism and Marxist analysis ultimately regurgitates Orientalist and racist myths, and while the Marxists outwardly opposed European imperialism, they ultimately justified it.